Good evening, everybody. Dr. Gloria Pope here, and I am here with the amazing Gail Ricketts. Hey, Gail. Hi. Hey, I'm so excited to actually speak to you today because I think you're like really, really cool. And I'm really excited to talk about your work and everything all about you. So please tell everybody about your books or your business or whatever you want to share because you have so much. Okay. Well, first and foremost, I am a Black girl from the Bronx. That's where I was raised. And um, I went to college outside at the University of Pittsburgh, stayed there seven years. And then I came back and went to NYU Law School. So I'm an attorney. And about when I was about 37, I ended up marrying someone who was an active, actively addicted to um, drugs. And I had realized at that point that I needed to make some meetings. So I started doing uh, some 12 step uh, meetings for family groups, for family and friends of people addicted to out, not drugs, but alcohol, the drugs. Mm -hmm. And um, it was when I started making those meetings that I realized that I was uh, a codependent. And, um, and so from that point on, I started to work on my own recovery and healing. Um, in terms of the emotional piece, I had academically been very successful all my life, yeah. but had never really addressed some of my family of origin issues, things that I had experienced as a child, some childhood traumas. I had sort of suppressed that. And when I started making these meetings, it really opened up me looking at myself in the mirror and really working on myself. And from that, I transitioned into um, doing some women retreats. I started doing women retreats because I realized there were women like myself, similar, similarly situated, that had never really dealt with issues. I mean, they were church goers. I was going to church, but they had not really dealt with some of the issues. And so I started doing a woman's retreat in my house. Um, and it was very successful. I still do it. And when the COVID came, I started doing the woman's retreat once a month on Zoom. Okay. And in the process of this year, I'm going to wrap this up so you can ask me some questions. <laughs> I decided I was going to do this book that I had been thinking about for 10 years about my journey from poverty into being a successful lawyer. But more importantly, I wanted to really get the message out to young black and brown girls that it doesn't matter how hopeless the situation is, there's always hope for a better day. Um, I am a, a witness to that. Mm -hmm. um, and so I wrote the book in the, this year that we were in the COVID. Um, I, I, I uh, call it a trilogy. Uh, the first part is called God Directed Relevation. Second part is God Directed Redemption. And the third part, which I haven't written yet, is God Directed um, restoration. Mm -hmm. And the reason why I did it in three parts was I'm, I'm 66 years of age. I have a lifetime of experiences mm -hmm. and I didn't see myself being able to sit down and do a book about my whole journey. So I felt that let me get something out. Mm -hmm. So that's why I decided to do it in three parts. And that's how it came about that it's a trilogy. And so I started from my humble beginnings from birth to 12 years of age. I chronicled that okay. and then you know and then part two picked up from 12 to about 30 years of age and so and then part three will pick up from 30 through the present through adulthood so, very interesting yeah very interesting concept so let's re re rewind so let's go back why did you pick pittsburgh well actually what happened is i was in my uh, uh, had a very good college advisor. I went to Walton High School in uh, the Bronx. It was an all-girls mm -hmm. high school at the time. And a uh, Black woman, a college recruiter, came from the University of Pittsburgh. And she spoke to us. And she was just so, I was so amazed by, you know, she just promoted the university. She was talking about it had an awesome Black Studies department, one of the best in the country at the time. Mm -hmm. And um, they were offering scholarships. Um, and my college advisor said, give it a try. I was the first person in my family to get a college degree. So I felt like I'm not capable of going to college. I don't have any money. I don't have any parental mm -hmm. contributions, mm -hmm. but she said, put the application in. And I was accepted and I was able to get a scholarship, academic scholarship. And I worked, work study and I did the student loans. So a combination of those three things I went out of state. I don't know if that was a good idea because as an out-of-state resident, 
I had to pay yeah. out-of-state tuition fees. Mm -hmm. But the good thing about it was the University of Pittsburgh had 30,000 undergraduate students. It was a major wow. university. And even though it wasn't a Black college directed, it was one of the best experiences that I um, had because it, it made me do a geographical change from the city, something I yeah. was familiar with, to go to a whole nother state. I didn't know anybody mm -hmm. there. And I met people that I really connected with from, the, you know, from Philadelphia. So I was meeting people from different states internationally because they have like international programs there. Mm -hmm. And it just opened up a world for me that I would not have experienced had I stayed in the city and commuted back and forth to college. It was one of the, I call it a God intervention. Mm -hmm. One of the God interventions in my life. It opened up and expanded, uh, opened up a world that I would never have, have experienced had I stayed in the Bronx in New York City. So it was one of my best decisions that I made. No, I can see, I got up and went away to school too. I left Mount Vernon and went to Philadelphia to go to school. So I went to Temple. So I totally understand where you're coming from with that. This the opportunity to be around new people, new new space, space, and just honestly getting off the block, right? Because we all need to get off the block to experience new things, see, to evolve and to learn how to be different sometimes. So it's all Absolutely. about evolution. And you can't do that on your own street all the time, your whole That's life. Right. Absolutely. So then you came back home and then you went to the amazing NYU. What made you choose law? Well, actually in my high school uh, yearbook, when I asked you, what do you want to be when you grow up? I said, I wanted to be a lawyer because at that time, and I'm dating myself, Perry Mason was like a hit show back in the seventies. And I just thought he was, he always won his cases. And I was like, I want to be like him. And I um, actually, I got my undergrad via uh, Bachelor of Arts. Okay. I ended up getting a master's degree in library and information sciences. I got distracted for like two years because uh -huh. I ended up working full time at the university after I graduated and uh -huh. tuition was free and it was relevant. That degree was relevant to what the job that I was doing, which was computer research. So I actually have a master's that I never used. And then after I was there for seven years and, you know, I felt my, I was limited in, in my opportunities. I had a bunch of student loans that I was going to have to pay back. I decided, listen, you really want to go to law school go back to school. So I did the arrogant thing. I said, listen, I'm, I'm, I'm not, this, this degree is not paying off yet. I yeah. got two degrees and I'm broke. Mm -hmm. I said, I'm going to apply to just the Ivy League law schools and let the chips fall where they may. So I applied to Harvard, Columbia, and NYU. Mm -hmm. I got accepted to all of them, but the wow. only one that was giving me scholarship money was NYU. And that's where you went. So that's where I chose NYU. And that's how that I ended sense. up there. <laughs> that makes sense. That makes complete sense. So how was your experience there in law school back then? I'm going to be honest with you. The first year was traumatizing. It was a lot of racism. Mm -hmm. It was the first year that NYU had allowed 42, what they call minority students admission. And that was a combination of um, African-Americans, Latinos, Asians, women at the time was considered minorities. Yeah. And so they had let 42 of a, a, you know, the combined um, groups. Mm -hmm. And they felt that um, it was bringing down the standards, like we didn't earn the right to be there. And so there were very derogatory racist articles in the law journal. Um, the teachers were, some of the teachers were very racist. So the first year was very challenging because besides being proud of the fact that I had accomplished even admission to such a, a, a prestigious school. Mm -hmm. I felt like I had to prove that I was worthy to be, you know, as a black student to even be admitted. So it, that yeah. was a whole yeah. other separate pressure mm -hmm. on the, the students that went to school with me, but mm -hmm. I was able to get through it and graduate. So it yeah, didn't right. matter what they thought. <laughs> I wasn't going to give up. No, I feel you. So what type of law do you actually practice? Well, when I first started out, I started at a small firm in the Bronx and uh, the specialty was um, accident cases, negligence okay. cases. And it was a diversified um, civil, you know, on the civil side. I've never done criminal law. And so I also used to get some cases, you know, divorces, child support, yeah. real estate closings. But the main, my main specialty was 
negligence. And then about 1993, after working there for eight years, uh, my, my mentor, he, he passed away and I ended up um, deciding to open up my own practice. And when I opened up my own practice, I opened up a practice with a diversification and a civil side. So I would do civil litigation, the same types of things that I did there, the, the, yeah. the accident cases. But I realized that the accident cases is long-term money because yeah. it's on a contingency basis and mm -hmm. I needed to pay the bills. So I had to do a lot of other stuff, but I was able to transition at that point to guardianships, the mental hygiene law, guardianships of the mentally uh, um, ill or disabled mm -hmm. and elderly. Got it. Um, and I was able to special. So that's my specialty right now in the States, the wills and estates. So I transitioned once I went, um, I would say in 2005, I really went full blown into specializing in the guardianship area. Oh, okay. Because everybody needs to be taken care of, right? And not taken advantage of. Yes, that's true. In fact, what I do now, um, I only, I, I don't really, I'm not really a guardian anymore of other people except for one case. I'm oh. actually a court appointed court examiner. And my role as a court examiner is to for one of a better way of, of defining it, audit other guardians' accountings that they're required mm. annually to file in the court. And I actually look over the background of financial documentation yeah. and I report to the court to make sure that they have not misappropriated the disabled and incapacitated person's money. So that is really what I really specialize in um, right now is I'm doing the court examiner work. That's so funny. I'm not going to name this movie that I just watched recently. You know, I'm not going to make no free promo, but it was about that. Somebody who just did that and nobody was following up with this crazy lady and she was just taking everybody's money. But it's but it happens, though, the elderly are felt victim to it all the time. I like some people around my family, they can receive those phone calls. Oh, this is the IRS or somebody's going to get locked up. I'm just trying to figure out how do these people know that they're really calling the elderly all the time? Because they call them and they tell them and threaten them. Oh, your grandson's locked up and you got to send this money to do this. It's really sad how crooked people are, you know, and take, and they get scared I, and they get anxious. It's not, not even healthy. I saw, the, I saw that movie and it did, it did a disservice for the field because there are a lot of lawyers and social workers that get appointed as guardians who really, excuse me, do the right thing yeah. and don't misappropriate. But there are people like the woman who was depicted in that movie, yeah. who the sole goal is to gain access to the funds, particularly when it's an elderly that doesn't have family members mm. that are keeping up with them, no children. Yeah. And it, you know, so you saw what she was able to take over the house, the bank account, slap the person in the nursing home and yeah. had a, it was in collusion with the nursing home staff. I saw that that movie. It was really frightening, but some of that was real. Mm. It's really real. Um, I've experienced it as an examiner looking at how money is misappropriated and having to report to the court and bring it to the court's attention. And I've also seen in other cases where, you know, lawyers got caught out there for gambling with the money, particularly for someone rich and their family members realize, wait a minute, you've been tapping into this account like it's your piggy bank. So it, it, there's some horror stories, but there are also some really good stories where people are doing really wonderful things for the elderly and the mentally handicapped to make sure that not only that their money is properly managed, but that their personal needs are met because you can be a guardian mm -hmm. but just the personal needs and not have access to the money. Or you could be a guardian just providing assistance with money management, or you could be assigned and appointed to do both. Okay. So, so, so it depends on what you're, what you're appointed that will define the scope of your duties. So a lot of times people are doing some really good work to make sure that they are properly taken care of. That's really cool. So let's flow into this idea of codependency, right? So you, you share that you married an individual who was addicted to drugs and you kind of was there, right? So explain to me what in essence codependency is and what it may look like, because I know this is, is big time in our community, just in general, how we're codependent on our own trauma. Well, codependency, I would say the root of, of the root of my codependency started with my mother. Mm -hmm. My mother was a heroin addict. And mm -hmm. at the age of 10, my sister was born. And because of my mother, 
being actively addicted to drugs and not really being at home a lot. I became like a surrogate mom to my newborn sister. So yeah. I took on the responsibility of being like a mom at 10. And yeah. that is like a classic case of codependency where you um, caretake other people and their needs become important to you. Now, most of the time you're not burdened with that responsibility at 10, but I would say that was the root of it. And then when I did a geographical at 12 years of age, I was actually removed from my mother's home, me and my, my siblings, because we okay. were considered neglected. I moved with an aunt and her husband uh -huh. and the environment was mu much improved. It allowed me to thrive academically, that yeah. geographical change, which I also considered a God intervention. But what happened is that sometime my aunt, aunt's husband would drink. Mm. And so when he would drink, he would get a little, you know, um, violent and verbally abusive. And then I played the role of being an intermediary between the two of them sometimes in terms of trying to calm him down and um, thinking that I needed to rescue her from her situation. So that is also a classic trait of codependency is that you feel this compulsion to either fix or rescue other people. And most of the time, the targets are needy people. It could be addicts, alcoholics, you know, usually it's someone who's very needy. You feel this compulsion that you have to rescue them or to fix them or be their yeah. caretaker. And you basically put their needs above your own. And it yeah. becomes an obsession and a compulsion. Now, my, my particular codependency um, manifested in, um, can you still hear me? Because my screen is frozen. Yeah, I can still hear you. Keep on going. My codependency that led me to the meetings was that I was addicted to addicts. Oh, wow. Boyfriends. So it, it morphs it from what I'm saying, the roots of it, to me having this unnatural attraction to needy men. Uh -huh. and, um, and that's how I ended up with my husband, because I was attracted to, you know, guys that were mostly unavailable, whether it was through addiction to alcohol or drugs, womanizers long distance relationships, but one of the threads that I saw was they all were mostly unavailable and I was attracted to that. And I didn't understand it until I started to make meetings. Uh, I went into therapy for a short period of time to kind of get the courage to sort of disconnect from that bad marriage. And um, that's when, like I said, my process of recovery from codependency started because I became aware that I was a codependent. Yeah. And and it transitions, you know, to different people. So after I got out of the marriage, I still had boyfriends and I was still picking up people and mm -hmm. oh, I could be codependent with my son and take on my grown adult's responsibilities. It's, it's in me to caretake. I have to put arrested and make sure that I have some healthy boundaries and mind my business when I need to buy my business and ultimately understand that I'm not in control of other people's lives. I am really Ooh, that one hit hard because I'm I told like this is why I was so interested in having this conversation with you because I align with so many things that you say and I've had very similar life experiences. So now I'm just like even with some transitions I'm going with with work and I feel as if for a while I was like, okay, my team, my team, my team, I have to protect my team, I have to protect my team. I started thinking about protecting them so much and I just feel like protecting myself. And then I had to stop. I was like, oh no, uh uh, uh, uh what are you doing? What about you? And I just had to like reframe myself to realize that it doesn't matter. They're going to fall on their feet or fall on their butt. It's going to figure it out. But I got to take care of me and me first. And um, but I do that. And, you know, I cling to people. I'm a caretaker. But it, again, very similar lifestyle. A lot of things happened when I was very young who put me into feel that way and the need to do that. So that's why I was really excited to talk to you because I totally get it. And I don't think that we are alone with that and those behaviors. I think a lot of people don't realize that they have those behaviors and for what reasons they may have those behaviors. So these are the types of things that's fully disclosed and talked about in your book series. Yeah, it's it, the, the, the journey up until 30 discloses all of the relationship failures and the different things. It's the third part where I actually am gonna be talking about the recovery process. 
Mm. So I haven't written that part yet, but that's why I left it for last because it's me showing you how dysfunctional I was in my denial, which is like sleepwalking Mm -hmm. and not being aware that there was an emotional piece that I hadn't dealt with. Because like I said, externally, I was successful. I'm a lawyer. I have a Mm -hmm. car. I have an apartment. But emotionally, there was still a void there that had needed to be filled. And I tried to fill it with relationships when I needed to fill it with Mm self-love. And so um, that's the third part is really going to focus in on that, that, that process of coming to grips with the fact that I am powerless over people, that God is ultimately in control of all of us, and I'm nobody's higher power, mm-hmm. and that I need to have healthy boundaries so that I don't be a martyr, and then I get sick. Because I think one of the experiences that I would like to share quickly was when I had a sponsor, she was obsessed with her family members. The husband was an alcoholic, the, the, the sister, the mother, the, the daughter was an overeater, the, 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 the son was a drug addict, and she had cancer and died. And at her funeral, she was a Catholic, all of those people she worried about was in the front, sitting in the front, and her casket was there. And I got the wake up call that mm. the caretaker was dead, and all of the people that she cared about were still alive. Wow. That was like one of the biggest wake up calls that I got that codependency can kill you mm-hmm. if you don't have healthy boundaries, if you don't set boundaries. One of the things that's very dangerous about codependency is that most codependents are loving people. We go into the fields of social work and nursing and things where we're going to be helping people and education. And, it, and it's a, it, right, it, being an educator. And it's a good thing to be caring and loving. The problem is, is that when you do so at your own detriment. Mm -hmm. So sometimes when I say to people, you don't need to be caretaken, they think you're being mean. That's not nice. She's, yes, she's being nice, but she looked like she's exhausted. She looked like she's being depleted. Mm -hmm. So if she's being depleted and she's being exhausted and she doesn't realize she is being depleted or he's being depleted in order to care for someone else. That's what makes it unhealthy. And that's what makes it more difficult for people to want to acknowledge that Mm -hmm. they're a caretaker because they think it's something really good to do. And it is, but it has to have limitations. No, I agree. I see. I think that even people don't realize that even relationships are marriages that at some point in time, if your marriage is draining you so much, you have to realize when it is. And things have to be adjusted. Things need to be talked about. Things need to be figured out because it might be their behaviors that's just taking so much and so much and so much and you're entertaining so much that you, again, you're not even entertaining yourself and you got to know when to tap out because self-care is so important and you can't even have a strong relationship in either way, unless you're taking care of yourself first. And people think even with your own kids, kids are exhausting. Okay, they're completely exhausting. So, you know, you got to know when you got to tap out even as a parent. And I share that with my parents all the time. It's just like, listen, that 7.30, 8 o'clock bedtime is really beneficial. And but it's so early. It is because you need time for you every day, not just on Saturday when they go see grandma. Every day there needs to be time for you. So, you know, and, and I agree with you on all those things. I think it's just really important. That's why, you know, again, I'm just so happy I had an opportunity to speak with you so you can kind of express some of those things because I think this is a good conversation for people to have with themselves. So if they were looking to purchase your books or even become part of Saving Your Women Retreats, how can they find you? Okay, well, I'm on Facebook and Instagram now. I mean, I'm old school, so I'm not that much into technology, but my books are available on Amazon. Um, they're uh, available in two formats the Kendall Kendall uh, format and paperback. So they can order it directly from, um, they can order it directly from Amazon. But I also have a Square Cash um, uh, link where if you wanted to order a book directly from me to get an author signature, then I usually will send that link to people if they request it. Um, So they can get it that way as well, get a book directly from me signed, or they could just order the book from Amazon in the two formats. Um, once part three is out of the uh, part three of the trilogy, I will I'll be doing some research to probably do it and you know combine them all together in a hard copy. But that's like further down the line because I haven't even completed um, 
part three. But what I did want to piggyback on one of the things you said about relationships is that one of the things that I realized is that I was bringing a broken person into my relationships and I was looking at them and saying, they're messed up. But I wasn't a whole individual coming to the table. Mm. And so I realized that I needed to be whole in order for the relationship to be healthy, just like I needed a healthy partner because it takes two people. So a lot of times we think, well, he's messed up, you know, he's this and that. I mean, I was, that was a finger pointer, like da, 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 da. five fingers, four fingers pointed back at me. And not my, this is, this is me. And, it, and I had to take a real good look at myself and say, you have issues. You brought baggage into this relationship because mm-hmm. beside my mom being an addict, my father abandoned me at five. So yeah. I was focused in, in the beginning of my recovery on the, my mother's addiction piece, thinking that that was really what damaged me of emotionally. Course. And then it wasn't until years later, I said, but how could you not realize an absent father abandoning a, a female daughter would not have any impact on her choices in men? Mm. It, I mean, it was like a wake up call. And I'm talking with all the education and the degrees. I did not realize that until very, very late in my life that that also was impacting on my self-esteem and my sense of self-worth, both traumas, the addiction, as well as the abandonment. And I'm probably, if I'm being honest, still working on the effects of the abandonment because I believe every female needs a positive male father in their lives, telling them that they're precious and they're lovely and they're beautiful Mm-hmm. So that when they make a choice in a partner, they'll expect that person to treat them accordingly mm-hmm. in a certain way, you know? So it's been, um, it's been quite a journey. I can see, I can see, but thank you so much for your time today. I, you know, I'm going to have more conversations with you because you're just amazing. I'm just really excited to, you know, have you in my life to be able to share some of your thoughts and your processes. And also I need that link. I'm going to have you email it to me because I need signed copies of your book. Okay, um, I'll definitely send the link. For my collection. All right. So again, so tell people how they can find you, maybe what your name is um, on, uh, what's your Instagram my, name? Uh, Ricketts9020. Mm-hmm. My full name is Gail Daphne Ricketts. Mm. Most of the time I go just by Gail Ricketts, but my full name is Gail Daphne Ricketts. That, that's the um, my full name is uh, on on the as an author is on the book Scale Daphne Ricketts okay on Amazon and uh, thanks for inviting me it's been a pleasure talking to you no definitely 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 thank you good night okay good night.